So the title of my talk, The Flying Car, How I Invented the Batmobile. Um, that, that's all the information that I got on uh, what to put together for this presentation. So uh, I hope you'll bear with me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Terrafugia, how we got going, and where we see the company going in the coming years. Thank you. So the idea of a flying car or a flying driving vehicle is really a very old idea. In fact, since the turn of the 20th century, uh, visionaries, pioneers in the field of aviation and automobiles have been developing concepts for flying driving vehicles. Uh, the first patent was issued in 1917, actually, and Glenn Curtis, one of the earliest aviation pioneers, conceived of the uh, Curtis Aeroplane in 1919, which was exhibited at the Pan Am World's Fair. Excuse me, World's Fair. None of these vehicles met with commercial success. The closest that we ever came to having a commercially viable flying driving vehicle was actually uh, started by a gentleman by the name of Molt Taylor. He formed the Aero Car Company back in 1949. And his vehicle is the, the vehicle on the lower right there, the Aero Car. This was a vehicle that dr carried two people, could drive down roads at highway speeds, and it took about 20 minutes to detach the wings and tail section and trailer them behind your vehicle. Um, at one point in the 60s, he had a deal with a manufacturing company lined up, and they were going to go into production, and they were going to produce about 1,000 units per year. All he had to do was get deposits for 500 vehicles, so half the annual delivery, uh, delivery rate. He was not able to get 500 deposits for the vehicle, and the concept sort of was set aside. And around that time, in the late 60s, early 70s, that was right when a lot of new regulation was coming out, having to deal with... Um, automotive safety, things that his vehicle didn't incorporate. His design, which was actually certified by the CA, the precursor to today's Federal Aviation Administration in the United States, was the last flying driving vehicle to ever be certified by the FAA. So this has been, this is a very old idea that's been a long time coming. So the big question is why now? What's different? What's different today? Why can we do this today? Why does it make sense to do this today when it hasn't made sense for a century. Well, to answer that question, uh, we took a step back and we said, well, what could we do? I was, I was an aerospace engineer at MIT. I so said, what, what could I do that has the potential to have a significant impact on this aerospace industry, this aviation world that I've been trained uh, to supposedly know so something about? And uh, I had been a pilot since high school, actually. I, I was one of those kids that was just fascinated with aviation from a very young age. I started saving up for my pilot's license when I was eight years old, got it as soon as I could in high school. And I ran out of time and money and haven't really flown very much since then. But I'd always had this just, uh, this love, this, uh, this really uh, illogical, love for the idea of the freedom of flight. The idea that, you know, I, instead of having to have driven around the water a uh, half hour to get from the airport here to the hotel here, I could have flown across in five minutes. Um, that's possible. It's totally possible, and it's not all that unrealistic. Uh, in fact, the United States, you know, Tom mentioned a lot about the infrastructure that the United States built up in the post-war, post-Second World War era. Well, one piece of that infrastructure is a network of over 5,000 public airports around the country. There's a little airport on average within a half hour drive of wherever you are in the United States. But most of the population has no idea that they exist or that they could be useful. Um, most of the general public in the United States flies through 27 international airports around the country, 27 out of over 5,000. So NASA identified this network of 5,000 airports as America's largest underutilized transportation resource. So how could we make better use of this? And why isn't this being used today? There are lots of pilots. In fact, there are over 600,000 licensed pilots like myself in the United States. Why don't we fly? Well, there are a number of fundamental reasons why flying is, is harder to do than driving and less convenient. 
Back in 2002, a former professor of mine at MIT conducted a survey of about 1,500 pilots statistically identifying the four largest obstacles to the more widespread use of personal aviation. And the biggest problem pilots face is flying little airplanes is just really a weather sensitive activity. Whenever the weather gets bad, you can get stuck somewhere. That's no good. If you want to use it for business, uh, you need to go where you need to go. You can't be stopped when you know, the clouds come in. It, it's, it's, you have to be able to rely on it if it's going to become a larger part of our, of our society. Second biggest problem is the ownership costs are very high. It costs a lot not only to buy the airplane up front, that's primarily due to the low volumes in which they're produced, but also to maintain your aircraft and to keep it protected. It's a major investment. You want to keep it indoors, keep it protected from weather. Uh, so you have to rent a hangar, typically. On top of that, you've got fuel costs, which right now are uh, going through the roof in aviation, uh, around the world, everywhere. Finally, pilots identified long door-to-door -door travel time and limited ground mobility at that network of 5,000 airports as huge obstacles. You get to these little airports, and because the volume is so low, Hertz and Avis and the other rental car companies, it doesn't make sense for them to have an office there. So you get there, and you're stuck. Some of them have a car that you can borrow, uh, but the vast majority of them have absolutely no way to get around. So you land, you get on your cell phone, you call up a cab, and you wait 20 minutes for it to show up and pick you up and drive you to where you actually want to be. And that contributes to an overall longer door-to-door -door travel time than you could otherwise achieve by flying really fast between two points. So these four problems are why that huge network of 5,000 airports in the United States today is highly underutilized. And these are the four problems that we sought to address with a flying driving vehicle. So it's helpful to get a little sense of the context of this industry, uh, of the aviation industry, because the idea of a flying car is not one that's going to come out of the automotive world. It really has to come from the aviation world because that's where you're selling to customers who are already familiar with the responsibilities of flying in, in an aircraft, uh, in an airspace system. Uh, so that's where it's going to begin, but that's not necessarily where it's going to end. The history of general aviation is a rocky one, as you can see here. This is the, the history from the end of World War II to a couple years ago. Uh, coming off of World War II, the industry shipped about 35,000 units. In the early 50s, really busted. The market was saturated. All the pilots from uh, the end of the war had their aircraft. Uh, gradually, the market built back up over time with a little dip in there for the oil embargo. And then the, the 1980s came around, and the industry almost entirely went out of business. And the reason, basically, was product liability. You had aircraft that had been flying for over 40 years that would crash, and then the estate would sue the manufacturer for an aircraft that they would claim was defective. And in the United States, one of the things that we are also famous for is a very litigious society. And the big companies decided that, you know what, this is too much exposure for us. We're not making most of our money selling little airplanes. We're making most of our money selling business jets, selling very high-end products. So they got out of the market. They just stopped selling airplanes. They didn't want to be in this market. 1994 came along. Congress passed the General Aviation Revitalization Act. From 94 through 2010, or excuse me, 2008, just before the economic downturn, the general aviation industry was seeing about 17% compound annual growth. In 2004, while I was working on uh, my PhD, I'd been keeping track of the industry publications uh, that had come along through the years since getting my pilot's license. And in 2004, I saw something that really caught my attention. Uh, the FAA was changing a fundamental way about how they regulate a certain category of aircraft at the very low end, the light sport aircraft sector. And they had not only made it easier for manufacturers to bring new products to the market, they also created a new type of pilot's license that takes less time and less money to get. So they lowered the barriers to entry on both fronts. And this really has created a, a renaissance in the general aviation industry. In fact, since this rule came about, we are now seeing more activity in general aviation than we've seen since the 1930s. 
it's really a remarkable time uh, if you're a general aviation manufacturer. So 2005 comes along, and I convinced a couple of my cohorts uh, at MIT to start digging into this, say, could we leverage this significant rule change to revive this old idea of a flying driving vehicle, something that has the potential to fundamentally address those four largest obstacles to the more widespread use of general aviation. So we started digging in. We started researching previous attempts. We started undertaking configuration studies. We had our first meetings with the FAA because you know, the idea of a flying car is, has been around in pop culture for so long that it really is sort of a fringe concept and has been for quite some time now. Uh, so we, we wanted to meet very early with the FAA and find out, look, if you're not going to let us do this, tell us now and we'll stop wasting our time. Uh, fortunately, we, we met with some regulators who uh, were willing to say, well, you know, there's nothing in the regulations that expressly prohibits this sort of vehicle. That was enough for us. Um, so we started drafting a business plan. And uh, part of that process, we started looking at, we started putting together the, the economic models for how a vehicle like this could impact the general aviation marketplace, given the fact that it's going to start at low volume, it's going to start with a high price point, much higher than a normal car. What potential could this have? Well, this chart that I'm showing you right now tells you, on average, if you have to travel a certain distance and you value your time at a certain level, which means of transportation would make the most sense for you to utilize? Whether it, if you're driving short distances, cars generally make sense. If you're driving very long distances, over 1,000 miles, typically you're, it's going to be very hard to beat the airlines. But there's an intermediate travel range in that 100 to 500 mile range where general aviation, light aircraft, small aircraft could actually have significant value, significant economic value. They could save people time. They could save people money. So we put together this model and we said, well, what, what happens when we introduce this vehicle that's going to save you time on either end of your trip? Because you're not going to be spending time calling up a cab, waiting for it to show up. In fact, the vehicle can convert between flying and driving in about 20 seconds. Well, when you do that, you see we take a, a big fraction of that existing market and we push the bounds down. We lower that, that minimum uh, time value that's needed. So we're fundamentally expanding the general aviation market. And we're also pushing down the, the average trip distance at which uh, using a vehicle like this would make sense, down to around the 100-mile range. Now, so that was, that was enough for us. We quantified the market and dug in. Uh, 2006, I entered into uh, the Lemelson MIT competition for inventiveness and I was awarded a, a $30,000 prize for inventiveness at, at MIT. Our business plan that year also uh, won $10,000 in the MIT Entrepreneurship Competition. So we took that $40,000 uh, from the two prizes, and we took our fledgling company, which we had just incorporated with, I think at that time, we had four founders, five founders. Uh, and we took our concept which at that point was really nothing more than computer graphics and a wind tunnel model to the largest trade show in aviation. And at that first show, we met some of the folks who would become both our first customers and our first external investors. And we left that show with seven deposits in hand for, to sell seven aircraft. Um, so that, that was a good sign for us. 2007 came along. And uh, we closed on our first round of external investment right around the end of 2006. We moved into what basically was a garage, 3,800 square feet. Uh, and we started working on uh, this new vehicle. And you can see, when we, when we started, there were four of us that went in and you know, didn't take a, uh, what would be called a, a better job by a lot of our, our contemporaries. Um, and we, uh, we jumped in. Uh, we started building a, a folding wing on a stand. That was the highest risk part of our vehicle. So uh, we built that, and we exhibited it the next year at the show. We got a few more deposits in hand. Went back. 2008, we brought on a few more people. 
we started building our proof of concept vehicle, the first vehicle that would actually fly, and that's the vehicle that was in that video. Uh, and we started doing our drive testing and taxi testing. And uh, 2009 was the first year we flew. We flew for the first year, in, uh, for the first time in March of 2009. Did lots of testing, started validating our, our modeling and our predictions. And uh, these are some pictures actually from some of that testing. So you can see it operates just like a normal general aviation aircraft. That's a Cessna that it's taxiing next to right now. And uh, flies like a normal aircraft. So it will be very familiar to both normal pilots that are out there today as well as uh, dr it drives like a normal car. It's, that's not Photoshop, by the way. I, I promise. It's, it's real. And our test pilot really likes it. So. Uh, 2010, uh, we took the lessons that we learned from that first proof of concept vehicle and we improved the design. Uh, we completed what we called our production prototype redesign. We moved into a larger space. Now we're in a 19,000 square foot facility. And we started work on a defense contract as well. Um, so we started getting a little bit of revenue in the door. And the company grew further. And just this past year, actually, we just exhibited this vehicle. This is our uh, first of two production prototypes at that large air show again. Um, we're very pleased to have it there. So this was the first public uh, exhibition of what we think will be the first commercial flying car. So a little bit about the product. Uh, it's a two-seat vehicle. It fits inside that new light sport aircraft category. It has modern automotive crash safety features. So since we knew the regulations were in place from the get-go, we incorporated them into the design of the vehicle. It has a safety cage, crumple zones, airbags, things that you don't find in any other general aviation aircraft out there today. We've done simulated crash testing of the vehicle similar to what they do in the automotive industry. And with the wings folded up, it fits inside a standard construction single car garage. Drives like a car, gets over 35 miles to the gallon on the road uh, using unleaded automotive gasoline. So it actually gets better gas mileage than most cars on the road today because it's very lightweight, very aerodynamic. Flies like a normal airplane, over 100 miles an hour cruise, uh, with over a 400 mile range. So what are we doing with this product? Well, we're trying to solve the pilot's biggest problems, the weather sensitivity. We're mitigating the weather sensitivity. It's not really clear how we do that to a lot of folks. But the way we do that is if you're a pilot right now and you're flying on the way, weather changes on you all the time. And when the weather changes on you, you're faced with three really lousy options. Either you can turn around and go back to where you started and drive your car instead, or you can divert to whatever airport happens to be nearest to wherever you are and sit and wait for the weather to get better. Or you can push it and try to fly through the bad weather. Pushing it is one of the leading causes of accidents in general aviation today. It's why you hear stories about little planes. Uh, one of the reasons why you hear stories about little planes. In fact, uh, it's the largest, has the highest percentage of fatality uh, of any type of accident in aviation. It's called get there-itis in pilot circles because you want to get to where you're going. We reduce the ownership cost by allowing owners to keep their airplane at home in their garage. So you don't have to rent a hangar. And it runs on super unleaded automotive gasoline, which is not only better for the environment than aviation fuel, but also costs about 30% less than aviation gasoline. The limited ground mobility at most of those 5,000 airports is no longer a problem. And the long door-to-door -door travel time is reduced because you're spending less time stopped on the ground at either end of your trip. It's the definition of a disruptive product, really. You have an old industry. You bring a new technology in that fundamentally is satisfying some of these old problems that everybody just assumed were not really things that you could solve. And, uh, and that's what we're doing with the transition. We're also setting the highest bar in the general aviation industry for safety, convenience, and fun. This is something that we're, this is sort of our mantra at Terrafugia, safety, convenience, and fun. Um, this is, I, I, and I do believe this, uh, I believe that we will be setting by far the highest bar for the safest aircraft, general aviation aircraft out there that you can get. It's designed not only to international ASTM standards, but also to federal motor vehicle safety standards. It has a 30 second conversion between flying and driving, park your plane at home in your garage, gas up at your local filling station, and really, what's more fun than having a flying car in your garage? Um, 
we're inspiring the public uh, and creating new pilots in the process because pop culture has been infused with this idea of a flying car and you know, we, we even had a Jetsons reference in our previous discussion. Uh, it, it's, it's out there. The idea is out there. And it, it's a powerful idea. It's one of the reasons why I was invited to this conference. Uh, it, it has that potential to capture the imagination and to inspire people to think outside the box. And it's an avenue to bring general aviation, light aircraft, the idea that you could go out and become a pilot and fly a vehicle like this, uh, bringing that idea to the rest of the world. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come here and share what we're doing at Terra Fugia with all of you is that I, I talked a lot about the economics of the model. And all of our business plan was really based on the well-quantified market for general aviation aircraft in the United States. Um, Currently, the United States accounts for over 50% of the market for general aviation aircraft. So that, that's our, our primary market today. But the world is changing. Uh, and right now, we have a lot of investment going on in general aviation in the developing world. Um, uh, the three countries that Tom mentioned, Brazil, China, India, are all investing right now in general aviation, much more so than the United States, I might add. So, a vehicle like this that has this potential to expand those barriers uh, or to, to knock down those barriers, excuse me, and expand the usability of light aircraft that made sense in the United States. Well, in countries with less infrastructure than in the United States, less superhighway infrastructure than we have, even though ours is, is declining right now, we still have a lot. We've got a lot of superhighways out there. In countries with less of that superhighway infrastructure, a vehicle like this can have an even bigger impact. And it can be more useful than it is today. In fact, the analogy that we've talked about is uh, the one of the cell phone penetration into the emerging world. Uh, you know, many places never installed landlines. You just went right to cell towers, right? Well, it costs a lot less to put in short runways than to pave thousands of miles of superhighway. So it, something to think about. <laughs>